video, we're going to cover the techniques used in the scarf that I'm wearing right now. It's called the Plumo Gradient Scarf, and it's brought to us by Zen Yarn Garden, both the tutorial and the free pattern. If you'd like to get your copy of the pattern to follow along, just click the little I in the upper right-hand corner. That will take you to my website, where I also have a link to the Zen Yarn Garden Gradient Kits, and the gradient kits are what I used in designing this pattern. The yarn used is uh, superwash, meaning it can be washed, machine washed, and super fine merino, so it's double super. It's fingering weight yarn, and there are 18 different colors available in the gradient kits, so be sure to click through and take a look. Um, these are the colors that I used in mine. They're kind of denim colors from dark blue to light blue, and uh, here is black to light gray. And this is the one that's going to get everybody excited. Berry colors and uh, plum to lavender, kind of. I love it when someone else picks the colors of yarn for me because I, I love it, especially when it's dyed to match. It's very exciting. This is just a small sample. There are 18 different colors available. Um, I'm going to put this pattern at an advanced beginner level. If you're comfortable with knitting and purling, we're going to cover everything else. And the, um, the stitch used in this is a feather and fan stitch. And I, I talk a lot in videos about bang for your buck. This is a good bang for your buck stitch because it looks really complicated. It looks like you've, your knitting skills are just amazing, but it's really easy to work. And I'll give you a close-up look of the feather and fan stitch. So it's light summer knitting, beautiful hand-dyed yarns um, in, these gradient, in these gradient colors. Just click the little I to go to my website where I'll have links to everything, your free pattern, the materials you'll need for, um, for knitting it. And next up, we're going to get started with the scarf. We are ready to get started with this scarf. If you've got your yarn and your free pattern, you can really use any needles that you want for this. I am going to use circular needles, and you'll see why, because I'm gonna string some lifelines in there to make this foolproof, absolutely foolproof. Um, and uh, circular needles make that a little bit easier, and you'll see why. But you can use straight needles or circulars, totally up to you. Um, I recommend that you use needles that have a decently sharp point on them because of all the knit two togethers. But so really blunt needles, you can still use them, but you'll have an easier time with sharper needles. Okay, um, let's go ahead and take a look at this bang for the buck stitch. Here is the feather and fan stitch. And it looks, so you see, it looks like there's so much going on, but there's really only one row out of four that you have to pay attention to. So the way that this gradient, um, the gradient uh, colors work in this is we start with the lighter color, la 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 la, and then we alternate um, stripes of lighter and the medium color, and then we move into the medium color, alternate stripes of the medium and darker color, and finish up with the darker color. And I designed this because you, know, you can see in the pattern photo that I wanted, I wanted the, the two ends uh, that were hanging in front to be the lightest and the darkest color with the medium color around the back of my neck. Anyway, that's how that looks. And so uh, we'll get started on this. It's mostly just four rows repeated over and over again. And so we're gonna talk about those. When you're knitting it, anytime you're knitting lace, it's going to look like this until you block it or steam it or something. And I wanted to show you this example so that you don't start to feel like something's wrong with yours because until it's blocked, it's always kind of a crumpled mess. This is what it looks like once it's had some steam applied to it. And this is the curly little mess that it is until then. So um, the first two rows of the pattern are just knit and purl. And now we're going to get into the pattern. Oh, well, let's talk about checking gauge first. What I have here is a little sample that is half as wide as the finished scarf. Um, and the finished scarf, let me double check this, I think, it's, I think it's 10 inches wide. It's 9 inches wide. So um, what you can do is there really isn't much of a need to check gauge. You can just cast on and start knitting a little bit and then measure by stretching it out so that you can really see the lace. And if when you stretch it out, you're getting something close to nine inches, 
then your gauge is right on. If you're stretching it out and you're getting something much wider, you probably want to use a smaller needle, or much narrower, you probably want to use a larger needle. But as long as you're close to nine inches when you stretch it out and look at it, you should be good. And I've allowed a little leeway in the pattern, so if your gauge is a little off, you'll still have plenty of yarn. That shouldn't be a problem with running out of yarn. Okay. So I have worked rows one and two in this, and so we're ready to get started on the action row, which is <laughs> row three. And I've got a marker placed. These, um, again, this is half of the scarf, but this is one pattern repeat, and this is another pattern repeat, so I'm gonna do it twice here. So we start with three knit two togethers. One, two, And if you need a review of Knit Two Together, I'll give you a link to that video right now. Okay, and now we're going to do six knit one yarn over. It's you know two stitches, knit one, yarn over, knit one, yarn over, six times. So we've decreased three stitches here. We're going to increase six stitches here. Knit one, yarn over, knit one, yarn over. Okay, I had to <laughs> double check to make sure I did six of those because I was talking. And then we finish off this pattern repeat with three knit two togethers. And so the stitch count never changes. It's always 18 stitches between the markers. Okay, let me see if I could do this. I'm gonna try continental because people who knit continental always want me to show yarn overs. You know what, I better do the knit two togethers <laughs> this way. Let me do this first. Three knit two togethers. And then, this is not my primary way of knitting, so don't laugh at me. I want to do knit one, yarn over. And to do that continental, you just kind of loop the yarn around the right needle. Knit one, yarn over. I should practice this way more. Okay, and now I have three knit two togethers. So we can talk about what we just did there. Um, starting here at the beginning, the, this is where all the decreases happen. This is where all the yarn over increases happen. And then we go back to decreases. And that's what gives us this open lacy pattern in the middle, the fan section. And the, I guess the feather section is, is here with the decreases. But when it all lines up, the effect is really nice. Now I wanna show you, I wanna talk about working the next row. Because if you haven't worked lace before, you might be intimidated by uh, you might be not intimidated, but confused by what the yarn overs look like on the other side. And this is a knit row. Row four is a knit row. Knit three. And the first stitch I come up to is a yarn over. That's not a real stitch. It doesn't have a knot under it. But you work it just like any other stitch, just the same. The only thing I suggest is if you have a yarn over in your work and the phone rings, don't set your work down, because that can just like fall off the needle pretty easily, and then you'll forget it's there. Um, so work that stitch and then answer the phone, or just let them leave a message. My trick at home is um, uh, to get through the yarn overs, knitting through the yarn overs before like the puppy wakes up or something. So that's just that's the important thing about this row four is to pay attention to the yarn overs. They don't look like real stitches, but they count. Okay. And as a safeguard, if you've never worked lace before and you're worried about messing up. I want to talk a little bit about lifelines. 
you may have been wondering what this white thing is in, in my work here. And this is just a, this is not part of the gradient set. This is just some, some fingering weight yarn in a different color that I'm using for a lifeline. First, I'm going to show you how to string a lifeline. So I'm going to grab a piece, if I can find the end. Grab a piece of this yarn and a tapestry needle. And this is what I call a proactive lifeline. I haven't made a mistake yet, but I'm setting myself up for easy recovery of my stitches in case I do make a mistake. So this is where a circular needle will come in handy. I slid the stitches over to the cord and it leaves me a little bit of room so that I can string the tapestry needle through all of the stitches. When you get to the stitch marker, go around it, not through it. You'll thank me later. Okay, and once you have that in there, that is your lifeline, that is your, your safety line in case you mess up. Um, you always want to do it after row four, so you know where you are. In case you mess up, you can rip back to this place and recover the stitches really easily. And I'm going to show you how to do that. Okay, let's say I'm doing lifelines every five pattern repeats. So one, two, three, four, five, put one in. Now um, we'll pretend I didn't put that lifeline in and I, I see that I have a mistake, you know, somewhere two rows back. So I'm going to take my needle out without worrying because I've got my lifeline. We're going to pretend I didn't put that one in. Okay, so I have my lifeline down here. I'm going to rip out to there, rip out below the mistake that I made. Oh, something I didn't mention. After you string the lifeline, you work the next row as if the lifeline isn't there. You just don't let it get in your way. Okay, so now I've ripped it out to the lifeline. All of these stitches are very safely held on the white yarn, no prob. And I can just take my needle, or I can also, I can also use a, a smaller needle. If I have like a smaller needle to use, I can do that. But this works fine. And I just run my needle back through those stitches, picking them back up, no problem. I'm not worried about anything unraveling. Because if stuff did unravel, it would be tricky with the yarn overs and the knit two togethers to get it back on the needle. But this is easy. This one's a little hard to pick up. Just pull the white yarn until the stitch comes out. There we go. You just do what you gotta do. Anyway, once they're all back on there, um, I recommend leaving the lifeline in. No need to rip it out. Leave it in there and keep going in case you have to rip back again. Okay. So the last part of this segment, um, we're going to talk about carrying the colors um, or atta attaching a new yarn and carrying the colors. So to attach a new color of yarn, first we'll, I'll show you that. I don't need to attach that in, in the pattern right now. I'm just going to do it because. I put, let me try this again. I put my needle in. I grab the new color of yarn that I want to use. I fold it over, leaving like a six inch tail, and then just pop it on the back needle that I've already put into the stitch and pull it through. And that is the new yarn attached. You can just work from there with the new color of yarn. Um, and then I will also tie the tail end of the yarn to um, the other color that I have going just to secure it in a tidy little knot. But I don't need to attach it because I, I already have two colors attached right now. So this is how you can carry the color up the side, the two colors up the side of the work without cutting the yarn every time you change color. It saves a lot of weaving and ends. So right now, I'm ready to switch back to the darker blue. And to get the twist of the yarn the same, 
running all the way up the work, I'm always going to pull the new color from under the old color, like this. You don't have to do it that way, just be consistent with how you pull it up and you'll end up with a really nice looking edge. And so, I'm going to just knit across with that. I can take a look at my tension there. On the edge, it looks good. You want to make sure you don't pull that first stitch too tightly because it can bunch up the work. But we're working with a really nice wool yarn here. So if you do end up with a little bit of tension issue on the edge, it's kind of okay. It should block out just fine with this beautiful wool. Okay, I'm working row one here of the stripes. And I want to work two rows here to show you how to catch the yarn, catch the other color. I'm purling this row. You know, I normally don't knit over a table like this. You might be able to hear the, the cord <laughs> against the blocking board. Almost there. Okay. Now I'm back to the right side of the work here, and I want to catch the other color that I'm not using. I still have two more rows to go in this dark blue, but I want to catch this other yarn. So I'm going to pull the dark yarn from under the um, the lighter color of yarn, the older color of yarn, and then start using it. And all I've done is just kind of get this lighter color of yarn wrapped up in the other color. So it helps carry it up the side. And then that, that's all you do. That's just it. Let me show you that one more time. I've got the dark here that I'm still using and the other one. I want to catch this lighter one. So I go under that, grab the color I'm using, and then start knitting with that. And it just caught up this color to help carry it up the side of the work. Those are really all the techniques used in knitting this. I tell you, it looks like a lot, but it's really not that hard. Uh, next up, we're going to talk about finishing work, blocking, stuff like that. Once you finish knitting your scarf, you want to block it out. And really, any time that you want while you're knitting it, you can always apply some steam to it and, and uh, smooth it out a little bit so you can see the lace. I always do that. I, I just like to see the way it looks while I'm knitting it. But it's, you can do that with an iron. Um, just blast steam into it without pressing down with the iron. You know, get it steamy and hot and then, and then um, pat it out so you can see what it looks like. There's no need to do that. It's just kind of fun, I think. Um, but after you've totally finished knitting it, you're going to want to block it. And this is super wash yarn, so you can machine wash it. Personally, I think it's easy enough just to wash it in a sink with some wool wash, plus wool wash smells so good. Um, a little bit of uh, cool water in the sink, a little bit of wool soap, put your scarf in there and, and squish it around to really get the wool into the fibers, and then let it sit for 20 or 30 minutes, and then take your scarf out of the water and, and squeeze, not wring, of course, squeeze it while it's wet, and then uh, take a bath towel, 
put the scarf in the bath towel and roll it up like a burrito and then step all over it. And that will squish out a lot of the water and then you're ready to set it out and block it. And I blocked this on my bed because it's a long scarf. I didn't have enough room on a blocking board or an ironing board to do it. But I'll tell you, these colors were perfectly color fast. There was no color bleeding in the water or even on my white quilt when I set this out to block. No color bleeding at all. So that's nice, isn't it? Okay, let's talk about the specifics about blocking this so that it looks its best. Let's take a look. Okay, at this one end, at both ends, we have this scalloped edge. And while it's wet, you can pull these points out. I'm telling you, I did this right in the quilt. No problem. Pull these points out and even exaggerate them a little bit because they'll shrink back up when it's totally dry. And you can use your measuring tape to make sure that you're getting this nine inches across. And let it dry like that with the points pulled really hard. And then they will shrink back up, but you'll still have that really nice shape. And then when you get to the stripe section of the scarf, it the there is no shaping in the stripes, but it's the shaping above and below that gives these waves. But you can help them along a little bit. This is, this is the method that I, I came up with for this. Take two fingers and put, pull down and up, just a little push with your fingers like this, to exaggerate the waves while it dries. And then let it dry like that, and uh, it'll hold. It will, it will stay just like it is. It's, the waves are there, even when it's wet, but you can, you can exaggerate them and let them dry that way. And then it's just a matter of setting it out so that it's even and straight um, the whole length of the scarf. And it dries pretty quickly. I was surprised. I set it out flat to dry, and I didn't even remember to turn on the ceiling fan in my bedroom when it was drying. And I had the back door open, and it was really humid outside, but it was still dry within a couple of hours, so I was, I was surprised about that. Anyway, those are all the techniques used in making this scarf. I hope you give it a try. Many thanks to Zen Yarn Garden for sponsoring this video and the free pattern. Be sure to click through to my website and take a look at the gradient, uh, the gradient color sets that Zen Yarn Garden is dying just for these. Good luck.